Good evening and welcome to a virtual town hall hosted by your 45th district legislators. Tonight you'll be seeing and hearing from Senator Makra Dingra and representatives Larry Springer and Roger Goodman. Some of you have submitted questions in advance and we will relay those questions to the lawmakers. You may also submit your questions live in the comments section of the plat platform you're watching on. Submit your questions now and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Before we get started with questions, the lawmakers will give some brief opening remarks. Senator Dingra. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our town hall. It is such a pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. And um, I just want to start by saying it is such an honor and a privilege to represent all of you in Olympia. And I'm very excited to talk about all the great work that we have been doing. I will start out by saying that um, I chair the Law and Justice Committee in the Senate. I sit on Ways and Means, and I also sit on the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. I am also honored to be the Deputy Majority Leader in the Senate. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Larry Springer. Thanks, Makra. Uh, Makra, I really appreciate that. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, we have been doing these uh, for many years now. The technology changes and improves each time we do it. So hopefully uh, I won't make a mistake here, but I really, uh, it's really great to hear your questions. Uh, it's, it's critically important that we hear from you folks. It's hard to do our job and do it well if we don't hear from you. So this is a good opportunity to share with us. Uh, I have been in the legislature now for, this is my 18th year. I am the uh, deputy majority leader. Uh, like Senator Dingra, I'm the majority leader, deputy majority leader in the House. I serve on the Appropriations Committee. That's the committee that determines how we spend our revenue. And I'm also on the Finance Committee, which is the committee that determines how we raise the revenue. Uh, and then I also serve on the uh, Agricultural and Natural Resources Committee and am a member of our eight-person uh, leadership team for the House Democratic Caucus. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Roger. Thanks very much, Larry, and uh, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Roger Goodman, and uh, Larry has said that he has served in the House for 18 years. I'm the junior member of the House. I've only served for 16 years. Uh, I do have to say that uh, Manka and Larry and I work extraordinarily well together. In some other legislative districts, uh, the members don't really get along too much, and they're not that effective. Uh, and so the three of us are communicating very frequently with one another, and we each have our own niche uh, in terms of issue areas. And I hope that we're serving uh, the district very well. I serve as the chair of the House Public Safety Committee and have for many years with jurisdiction over our criminal legal system, uh, dealing with the community safety and policing and uh, crime and justice. Uh, also on the Judiciary Committee, it's, it's called the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. I'm one of the few lawyers in the legislature, believe it or not. Manka is another one of the few lawyers in the legislature. Uh, and also on the Children, Youth and Families Committee. My focus just in general is to keep our communities safe and to make sure, sure that children are uh, well fed and housed and ready for school and success in life. Looking forward to your questions and uh, thanks very much for your attention. All right, our first question tonight comes from Tom. What is the summary of your progress to provide assistance for the mentally ill who need healthcare facilities rather than jail? Thank you so much for that question, Tom. I'm going to take that. You know, in the Senate um, three years ago, we actually created a behavioral health subcommittee to really make sure we're going to be very focused and have a um, long term plan and a strategic plan for the manner in which we are going to address behavioral health in our state. So um, I was honored to chair that committee, and it was a very hard decision when I was offered the chair of law and justice, but I did take. The, the chair um, of the Law and Justice um, uh, Committee position. So in the last few years, what we have been doing is really taking a concerted effort at looking at every single point of entry into the behavioral health system. And we're talking about from the time of pregnancy, birth, all the way to um, the end of life and taking a look at our elderly. Along that entire continuum, we are also taking a look at making sure we have early intervention making sure we have points of uh, interaction at every level. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm so excited about the bill that the House has passed and sent over to the Senate called Assistive Outpatient Treatment. 
And this is an attempt to make sure that we are providing services to individuals prior to them requiring uh, to be hospitalized and prior to them getting arrested. And so this is going to be a huge component in our continuum to make sure that we are getting people treatment when they want it instead of waiting for them to hit rock bottom. Um, we are also working on a bill that I sent over to the House and uh, I know it got out of the policy committee and is sent to appropriations. And that is taking a look at those individuals that are involved in our forensic uh, mental health uh, system and really trying to have an outpatient program for them as well. So we really are uh, have been trying for the last three years, very specifically trying to shift our system away from criminalization to uh, early intervention, because we know that having a behavioral health crisis is not illegal. And we have to acknowledge that reality and treat that reality in the most appropriate way. So I can talk a lot more, uh, but there's been a lot of focus on children's mental health. Um, and there's a lot of great work coming out of the uh, Youth and Children's um, Mental Health Task Force. And so a lot more on it, but I'll just say it's a very exciting time for the investments that we're making in behavioral health in our state. We have the new 988 number, and that's going uh, to be um, operational this summer. So lots more on it and a lot more that we, again, continue to do and need to do. And I'll just say the workforce shortage is a huge um, issue that is really impeding our ability to do uh, a lot more. I also wanted to comment on this. Monk and I have been working together on this, uh, what I call decriminalization of mental illness. Uh, too often, uh, the mentally ill and those suffering from substance use disorder fall into uh, the criminal system being arrested and uh, unfortunately incarcerated. We do have a couple of grant programs uh, to, and hopefully expanding funding for that to intervene with people who really are in deep trouble, uh, acute crisis, maybe even living on the streets uh, to provide um, a peer intervention and what we call harm reduction uh, to make sure to, to um, uh, intervene before they get arrested. But if they are arrested and if they're brought to the jail, we now are expanding more therapeutic options, uh, triage facilities and other uh, therapeutic facilities instead of jail. Uh, and also uh, what we call the warm handoff. If someone is in jail and suffers from a behavioral health crisis, that they're not just released from jail onto the streets, but uh, sent uh, into a therapeutic facility where they get a proper care. We've also made clear in legislation this year that's now moving through the, uh, the legislature to uh, for police when they show up on a mental health crisis to provide the necessary assistance to mental health providers uh, to make sure that they get uh, evaluated, uh, transported to a safe location so they're not a danger to themselves uh, or others. So we're making progress on decriminalizing mental illness. Our next question comes from Mamta. Washington has flourished economically in the last few years due to a huge immigrant presence. What does our state stand on supporting immigration generally? So maybe I'll take a, an initial stab at that. Uh, Monta, thanks for the question. Um, the largest employer in the state of Washington is the agricultural industry, which could not survive were it not for immigrant labor we have gone to great lengths to make sure that the immigrant labor in our farm uh, agricultural industry is number one here legally and are well treated when they get here. Uh, we have stood up over several years ago an e-verify system to help uh, uh, farm owners verify the, uh, the legal presence of immigrants. We've worked on a number of issues to improve the quality of farm worker housing. We have, uh, uh, I don't know how many, uh, uh, you know, task forces that we have created to, to really study the, the uh, application of pesticides to keep farm workers safe. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we have an agricultural industry that is second to none in the nation. We grow more crops in this state than any other state in the nation. And we grow the highest value dollar crops in the nation. Those would be our apples and our cherries. And none of that would be possible without immigrant labor. Um, and I think um, Maka may have another sector to talk about. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question, Mamta. As um, well, you know, when I got elected, I doubled the Women of Color Caucus in the Senate from one to two. 
So I love to take any opportunity to talk about the amazing um, economic uh, contributions, not, not even, let alone the cultural contributions that immigrants make to um, our population. And I just want to say this one statistic before I begin, and that is about one in seven Washington residents is an immigrant, while another one in seven residents is a native born US citizen with at least one immigrant parent. And I'll just say that in the um, in Washington, all of our programs, our policies, they impact all Washingtonians. We don't make distinctions between citizens and non-citizens. In those cases where the federal government does have barriers to non-citizens accessing resources, we actually um, do quite a bit to make sure that we are supplementing that as a state to make sure we're taking care mm -hmm. of all Washingtonians mm -hmm. because we know that all Washingtonians really have been uh, working hard to improve our uh, economy. And I'll just have to say, you know, take a look at the tech um, industry. Um, I know, especially in the 45th district, we see a lot of immigrants in, um, in the tech sector. While we have immigrants in all aspects of our economy, I think there's a huge component of it. So I just wanna say that from a state perspective, we like to work for all Washingtonians. I wanted to comment on this as well. Uh, uh, Monica mentioned our tech sector. Uh, Microsoft, as the, the largest corporation in, in our area, employs uh, people from 157 countries. Uh, and many of those foreign-born uh, look different from, uh, uh, from those who were born in the United States, the majority white population. And I really regret that there's an anti-immigrant sentiment in this country. Uh, and um, uh, discrimination and bias against uh, people who are uh, perhaps have different skin color. And those who work in the tech sector may be uh, a little bit more affluent, highly educated and highly paid, but they are also concerned about this anti-immigrant sentiment. And we've seen uh, nationwide and in our state, a lot of hate speech and hate crimes uh, uh, addressed at immigrants. Uh, and we are addressing this uh, in the legislature and also protecting uh, against uh, needless law enforcement activity uh, against those who are foreign born uh, or who are people of color. So uh, we care about all people uh, equally uh, and, and equity, social equity and racial equity uh, are one of our top priorities in the legislature. All right, our next question comes from Jerome. What are you doing to increase affordable housing, given how difficult it is to buy a house right now? So I'll maybe lead off, and I'm sure my cohorts here will have plenty to say, because the, the topic of housing affordability has literally dominated the legislature uh, in the last two years, uh, actually longer than that, but especially acute in the last uh, two years. Uh, we have an affordability crisis uh, second to none in the nation. In fact, we uh, Bellevue has just surpassed California's San Francisco as the most expensive housing market in the nation. Um, and it is a, a, a terrible burden for families to bear um, that are not uh, overtly wealthy. So the state, the legislature has tried a number of initiatives. Uh, we don't build housing. We don't know how to do that. But what we do do is appropriate money to send out to housing builders, the um, primarily uh, private nonprofit, uh, low income and affordability builders. Um, just in this last year, uh, we have appropriated $364 million to help families who are in houses now, but because of COVID, uh, we're uh, facing losses of jobs. So we've got uh, rent assistance. Um, we put $500 million into the capital budget in the, in the house this year. Uh, to help build uh, additional housing, another 1,500 units probably coming online. Um, and I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't point out that one of the key players in any kind of housing affordability effort are our local government partners. Because at the end of the day, the housing will always be built in some local government somewhere. So we have to work really carefully with our local governments on zoning, uh, we have passed a couple of bills to, to pursue uh, transit-oriented development. We certainly have done that in Kirkland and Redmond, um, as well as uh, accessory dwelling units. So 
Uh, lots to say about this, but uh, it is something that uh, really takes up a lot of our time. I'll comment briefly on this as well. Uh, there is legislation that is probably not going to move through this year, but it's very important to uh, uh, remove the uh, the ban on uh, density in cities near transit uh, zones to have uh, duplexes, fourplexes, sixplexes, uh, to make sure that we have more density, uh, particularly, again, near transit uh, areas. Uh, there's two objectives, and they're difficult to um, reconcile with one another. One is density, and the other is affordability. Uh, and in our area, uh, we are densifying, uh, but it's very difficult at the same time to have uh, affordable housing. Uh, and so the current legislation that we were considering uh, might have incentivized uh, more density near transit zones, but not necessarily have them be affordable. And affordable housing is really important in our area because we don't necessarily have the socioeconomic diversity that we need. Uh, it's uh, too expensive to live here. And so many people who work here have to travel long distances because they can't afford to live here. So uh, we need to work both on density to preserve our critical areas outside of the uh, urban growth boundaries, but also affordability. This is uh, one of the biggest challenges we face uh, and we're still working on it. And I'll just add a little bit to that with, you know, including everything that both uh, my, uh, the representatives have said, it's going to take every single one of us to address um, the housing crisis at the city level, the county level, the state level, but also individuals. Um, you know, we really need individuals to be comfortable not living in the McMansions and being comfortable with having um, higher density in their neighborhoods. And so it is really something that everyone is going to have to step up and take some responsibility for. And I'll just say, you know, I am just so always so pleased with the 45th district that they are willing to really make sure that they are um, actively working on solving problems. Our, our cities are really great partners with us. And I truly do believe that the residents are really great partners uh, and have a real interest in solving this issue. So thank you for that. Our next question comes to us from Angela. When will the light rail be running on the east side? The trains are running now. They are just not carrying anybody yet because they are all test runs. But if you uh, happen to be in Bellevue at the right time, you may see a light rail trail, a train uh, coming through town as uh, Sound Transit is now running uh, test runs. Uh, service should be starting here uh, later this year and should be extended on out to Redmond uh, sometime next year. So we're within a year of seeing trains run uh, at peak times, by the way, at eight minute intervals, um, estimated to carry 40 to 50,000 people a day. I'll just add that I, for one, can't wait. I am so excited to have those trains running and um, I'll just do a plug for the transportation package that the Senate has sent over to the House because what it does have in there is a provision where our youth can ride for free. And to me, that is critical because if we need to change the culture, uh, we have to start getting our children um, ready, willing, and excited to take public transportation. I know both my kids take uh, public transportation. And so I'm hoping that all of this will incentivize all of us to um, take uh, ride the train more often once we get it. Yeah, the light rail is coming into Bellevue and Redmond, uh, but not to Kirkland. Uh, and yet we do have what we call bus rapid transit that's going to be developed uh, as a link to the light rail uh, coming into Kirkland as well. So it's all going to be multimodal and linked to one another. Our next question comes to us from Naz. What is your agenda to support small businesses growing in your area? I can let me start with that one because we have a couple of bills in the House in the Senate that I am excited to talk about. We had a bill that provided $214 million uh, in unemployment insurance.